Hi, I can tell that everyone is still filtering in for our extra special sad holiday mm. extravaganza, but I'm going to go ahead and get us started with today's panel because we're very short on time. We have to end at precisely the top of the hour. So for those of you joining us, we're so happy to have you. Welcome to our first ever Spatial Analytics and Data Holiday Special. My co-hosts, Danny Arribas Bell and Levi Wolf and I are delighted to have you with us as we take a journey through past, present, and future to talk data, because nothing says holiday season quite like a panel session on data. Our sad holiday special comes in two acts. In the first act, our guests offer brief commentaries on data past, data present, and data future. And in the second act, we're visited by some ghosts. That's right, the ghosts of data past, data present, and data future, right here on your Zoom screen. So some very quick logistics. Um, if you can use the Q&A functionality that's on the bottom of your Zoom screen for questions and comments, I don't think we're going to have time for discussion with our super packed agenda, but just in case, we'll take those if any time permits. And we will end uh, precisely at five o'clock our time. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Levi Wolf for introductions. Hello, thanks. Um, so I'm just here to give quick introductions for all the speakers. Um, so starting off with our two um, data past speakers, we have Leah Vusan, um, is a professor of economics at Princeton University, whose research is at the intersection of economic history, er, history and labor economics. We also have John Logan, who's a professor of sociology uh, at Brown University, who focuses on contemporary and historical census data to study changes in residential patterns with a particular emphasis on immigrants and racial minorities. Then for our two speakers on the ghosts of data present theme, we have Leticia Galvan, who is a senior research scientist at the Institute for Scientific Interchange in Turin, Italy, whose work focuses on data science for social impact and sustainability, as well as Beth Tellman, an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. As a human environment geographer, Beth seeks to address the causes and consequences of global environmental change for vulnerable populations. Finally, for our ghosts of data future theme, we have um, Malka Older, who is a writer, sociologist, and aid worker who publishes a wide variety of academic research, fiction, and opinion for a wide variety of outlets on topics such as democracy, data, narrative disorder, and speculative resistance. Finally, we have Stephen Ruggles, professor of history and population studies at the University of Minnesota. Professor Ruggles directs the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation at the university, the home of many long-running sociodemographic databases such as IPAMS or the U.S. National Historic GIS. So with that, um, I welcome all of our speakers today uh, and I will um, hand it over to Danny. Thanks very much. So act one of the, uh, this event uh, is the, what we call the panelist statements. In this part, we're especially interested in data, what it is, what it comes from, and, it, and it's valued for a variety of constituents and constituencies. Uh, what we're going to have and the way it's going to work is every speaker will have about three minutes and please keep it to, to, the, um, to the clock um, to make an opening statement and then we'll run them up on act two. The order that we're going to follow is from past to present to the future. So we'll open with Leah Bustan and John Logan then Leticia Govan and Beth Tolman will pick up on the present and we'll um, wrap up with Mark Holder and uh, Professor Ruckel's statements. So uh, Leah, if you wanna go ahead and I think uh, Eva, you wanna put up the slide. Okay, thanks uh, for the invitation and thanks for everyone being here today. Um, I wanted to start with an apology because I am going to tell you a little bit about some data that's in my forthcoming book. Um, and so um, here I'm turning to Alec Baldwin from the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, um, who came in as a motivational speaker for a group of real estate agents, telling them always be closing. So always be selling, always be um, promoting your work. Um, so uh, I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about the data that makes up our my forthcoming book um, with my co-author Ron Abramitsky, um, Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. And it's not available for this Christmas season, but it is available for pre-order um, May 2022. So um, for those of you who know my work, um, when you think about 
um, what sort of data might be a part of the project, you're probably thinking about complete count census data um, where we are following uh, individuals over time in the United States, um, focusing mostly on immigrants um, and their children and linking them across census records so that we can find uh, someone soon after arrival in the US and then link them to a future census um, to look at their economic and social outcomes. Um, but when we think about data in the past, um, uh, what I wanted to emphasize is that data is actually everywhere. And as we have a growing set of tools uh, to harness data from the past, we can think of the entirety of the library as our source uh, for data past. So for example, um, we also turned to some genealogical records um, that were part of the American Jewish Historical Society collection to find participants in a mobility program. So these are immigrants who arrived in New York City and then were sent as part of this mobility program around the country um, to live in over 2,000 cities and towns. Um, we're able to link them up to their census records. So that's a source that we would not have been able to use um, just um, a, a few years ago. Um, we have um, 40,000 genealogical records um, from this program that were entered into a, a genealogy database. Um, and we can think about, well, that's not just for family history anymore, that's also a potential source of data. Um, and um, in addition to that, uh, we um, also uncovered a um, trove of oral histories for 1,200 immigrants who entered the United States through Ellis Island. These oral histories were collected by the Ellis Island Foundation in order to create the museum and the national park that is now at the that was my timer um, that was now um, that's now at the Ellis Island. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, center, but it's also a potential source of data. Um, so we have over an hour of recorded speech with each one of these immigrants, and that's something that we can turn into a data set and analyze. Finally, we're using 8 million speeches um, that were um, uh, given on the floor of uh, either the House or the Senate, and we've identified that 200,000 of them are speeches about immigration, and we can analyze them for um, for sentiment and tone. And so if you think about the full set of data that I'm outlining here on the slide, historical data, um, even in uh, terms of big data or big social science, is not just the, the US census anymore. It's also potentially linking up other records to the census, like the genealogy I mentioned. It's potentially harvesting text um, through interviews or speeches uh, that may not have ever been considered data sets before, but now um, with modern computing methods, we can turn these into data sets and go back and analyze it the past in a way we've never been able to do before. Excellent, almost on time, and I'm glad you had the, the timer um, there. So next is uh, John Logan. Yes, uh, I'm not going to do that much self-promotion today, although I, I guess maybe I should learn to do that. But uh, you probably all are aware that I, uh, I work uh, especially with data that I can map and that I'm doing my best to uh, share with the rest of the world uh, the, the, the historical maps at the neighborhood scale of starting in 1880, and I'm working my way up to the present. Uh, uh, on that. Uh, if you look at the Urban Transition Historical GIS website or the Longitudinal Track Database website, uh, you'll find uh, it keeps growing. So, uh, so I do that and, and in order to uh, support that work, uh, I have to always come up with a reason to use these data. What is the question? Who cares about this old data? And I get this question a lot from uh, uh, journal article reviewers, uh, not so much from like social science history because they take it for granted. But when you go to the, the mainstream sociology journals or urban journals, uh, they, they always ask, somebody always asks, and, and how is this relevant to the, to the present? Uh, and uh, NIH is pretty tough on that same kind of a question too. So, 
uh, I'll use my time. I've got uh, half of my time still to go. Why go back to the old data? What, what's the reason? And my major reason is that a lot of the things that we think are true about the past and that color our interpretation of the present are not true. And on this slide, I just list a number of, a number of things that, that I have pretty good reason to believe they're not true, but you could have thought they were. And in fact, the literature said they were. The, the literature said that segregation uh, really, there wasn't any segregation before uh, the World War I and the Great Migration. And there wasn't uh, that much segregation uh, in, the, in the works until the federal government started redlining on mortgages. And um, uh, if you read the literature a little bit loosely, you would have thought segregation in cities was rising after World War II, but actually it wasn't. What was rising was segregation between cities and suburbs. It was the selective suburbanization in the period at the metropolitan scale that mattered. And uh, just about everybody believes that income, in, income segregation was growing uh, in the whole period since 1980, but it turns out that, uh, that most of that, in fact, all of that uh, is a, a technical problem with uh, sample size. And so there's a lot of things that we that we imagine are true of the past. And when people like Leah go back and actually go to the, the oral histories of people and really get the details of what was actually happening and what was the experience of individual people in the past and documented that. And we're able to go back to neighborhood level data to see how neighborhoods were changing over time. Uh, we can correct those. And that's why I do what I do. Thank you. Fantastic. So jumping into the uh, present, next is Leticia. Thank you. Thank you um, to you, Rachel, Daniel, and, and Levy for the invitation. And thank you to the attendees. So I, I, here what I've done is that I've been trying to classify things into data opportunities and challenges thinking about data from present. And uh, so I thought about what, I, what was data from present for me. And of course, I, I, I thought about my experiences. So I classify them into mainly sat satellite images that I've been using to estimate poverty in places where usually you have no really access to data. Then a lot of the data sources uh, I'm thinking about data present have come from social media that allows us to do text analysis. And one source of data I'm mainly interested in is uh, data about mobility. And um, I think one, one of the uh, big uh, data sources, new data sources about mobilities are all the GPAs uh, data set provided by location intelligence company, and then of course call detail records. And all these new sources of data sets, they of course bring uh, opportunities. And one of them that I can mention is for instance, the possibility to look at understudied communities. So for instance, we've been looking at um, the gender gap uh, in mobility by using call detail records uh, in Santiago. So of course it was a topic that was studied before, but now this is something we can, we can do uh, at, uh, at a different scale and uh, also different spatial scale and different temporal scale. And in generally, uh, this new uh, kind of data sources, I think they can be a good help to tackle several of the sustainable development goals like uh, uh, gender equality is one of them, but also make cities uh, more sustainable. So for instance, with all the data sources you can get about micro mobility. So you have several API to get access to um, data about e-scooter uh, and I mean all new type of micro mobility around the cities. 
And another point that I think is one of the big opportunity when you think about data from present is really manage real time crisis. So here I'm thinking about the COVID pandemic. So in my case, I, I got lucky enough to have access right at the beginning of the pandemic to data about uh, mobility uh, of individuals. And I mean, this is something that is uh, crucial when you are going to, to study of course the spreading of, of the COVID because uh, of course one of the uh, key element of the spreading is the mobility of the of, of persons. So uh, we could really somehow uh, uh, study what was the reduction in mobility at uh, real time. But of course, uh, all these opportunities are great, but they go with challenges. And so one of the challenges is uh, obvious is the access to data. So the pandemic changed a bit uh, what was the uh, equilibrium here and uh, made companies to um, I mean, release data a bit easier than before. Uh, but still, access to data, we know, is, uh, is a big problem. Uh, another problem that I encounter enough, uh, I encounter, uh, sorry, often, is the, uh, to find a ground truth. So, I mean, it's nice to have access to this new kind of data set, but finding a ground truth is still, uh, is still a problem. And we, even though we have access to large-scale data, thanks to this new uh, kind of data, we still have a big data gap, I think. So we miss uh, some data about some marginalized groups. Uh, and then uh, two, uh, two points that uh, I want to, to mention uh, is about the reliability and generalizability. So for instance, for the study we did on uh, gender mobility in Santiago, so we made some observations that were uh, good for, for Santiago, but of course we would need to extend this to other cities, but then comes the problem of the access to data. And then the final point that is uh, crucial is of course about preser preserving uh, uh, privacy. So so this new kind of data also come with this drawback that of course was present before, but it's even more uh, obvious now uh, with uh, all this data. And I'm done. Excellent, super. So far you're all making my job very, very easy. So next we have uh, Beth Tillman. Okay, I'm gonna echo, um, I think a lot of the themes that Letitia talked about. So first, on on the left side of the slide is what i'm really excited about so satellite data um and you know we've had access to satellite data for a really long time but what's really changed is the spatial and temporal resolution of data and the number of satellites like hundreds and hundreds are being launched every year this graph actually which stops in 2018 is pretty outdated because even in just the last couple of years um i think we're now getting like hundreds of satellites launched every couple of months because of SpaceX and the commercialization of space and all of this money that's being poured into the space tech sector. So it's, you know, and it's not, it's really even more than just spatial temporal resolution. So what we can see and how quickly we can see it, um, but also the type of things that are being sent. So a lot of innovation in radar satellites that can see through clouds and satellites that can look at groundwater movement um, by sensing kind of differences in gravity. And we have satellites that are looking at really high precision estimates of emissions and pollution. And so there's so much um, that we can see and there is no sort of data scarce place now on earth because of this. And it's really, really incredible, incredible and politically interesting because for even for people in countries that don't want to be sensed, they're being sensed whether or not they consent to it, which, which is also a little bit of a problem. Um, I've been using satellite data. This is kind of the artistic picture on the left to look at floods. So that's a lot of the work that I do, but that's one of so many types of, of environmental change. Um, the other thing that's really exciting is our ability to process that amount of information. And I think it's really democratized access to big satellite data. Google Earth Engine was sort of the first platform that um, really kind of came public with allowing, with building an API and allowing for hyper parallel computing to process satellite imagery. But Amazon Web Services does it now. Microsoft has their own version. So this was kind of just the start. Google Earth Engine kind of what was the start of building this much larger market? And a lot of it is free for scientists to use. Um, I started a company based on kind of using some of these insights because I felt that in academia, it was sort of hard to actually build useful products from this information. And I had to kind of build another 
um, another institution outside, outside of that sector to really get satellite data to matter on the ground. And the other thing, um, Leah talked about this sort of big social science data. I think we need more of this, but I'm really excited about um, uh, following the money. So the Panama Papers and sort of the Paradise Papers and all of these other leaks that um, journalists have done that help us sort of track where and how money moves around the earth, I think is really important and exciting. But to me, the challenge is how do we actually spatialize that? So um, kind of on the right side for me is, is sort of the challenges and the things that I think we're not yet doing. Who cares if we can see all this change on the surface of the earth if we don't know who's causing the change? It's really hard to regulate if you don't know sort of the actors and you can't spatialize them on the ground. So to me, that's the big challenge. Even with climate change, I would say, we have sort of policy in, in the wrong place and not necessarily the actors in power um, that are causing those changes. So that's what I think we need to work on. Super. So excellent segue to start thinking about the future. And on that, we have first uh, Malka Older. Okay, I'm going to start my stopwatch so that I know when the future gets to three minutes. Um, three minutes from now, this presentation will be done. And so when I'm going to think about the future, particularly as a science fiction writer, but also as a sociologist who thinks about the ways that we construct futures, uh, I want to put it not as something that I can predict but rather as something that we make choices about. And so when I think about data in the future, although there are a lot of narratives out there about how our, our access to data is just gonna increase, increase, and increase, and how this is gonna cause all sorts of problems for privacy, I wanna think instead about what kind of future we want with data. Um, and I wanna also suggest the possibility that the future could look much more like the past than some kind of uh, progressive line, whether straight or exponential from here in the same direction we're going. So I want to think a little bit about the ethics and the applications of data. Uh, all these really interesting things that we've just been hearing about. Um, but, you know, we want to think about who is making these decisions and where is the ownership particularly. Uh, we have these questions about privacy. We have these questions about uh, marginalized communities and whom we can see uh, in the data that is available, who are making these choices about which data we prioritize. Um, and so I want to think about that, you know, not in terms of privacy as an absolute, because privacy is something that we will see if we look at the ghosts of the past and the present has changed. Uh, both over time and place, but over the questions of who decides what is private for themselves, for their community, um, and who has ownership over the data that is constantly being collected. We have so much data today in the world, and most of it is being used to sort of eke out these margins of profit for a very small sector of society. And so thinking about the future, I'd like to think about what are the possibilities for what we could do with the, the amount of data we have and the data collection um, that we have. And then I want to think again about how people said that there are these myths about the past. And then in the present, we're talking about the difficulty of still getting at the ground truth, even with the amount of data we have. Um, so something, something is missing there, you know, and there, there is this sense that uh, within everything we know, there's still a lot of fiction, there's still a lot of guessing. Uh, and so I want to suggest also that we continue to look at data from a very quantitative perspective. And I love quant, and I think there's so much that we can do with uh, quantitative, with numbers, with benchmarks, um, with counting, and with being able to graph things. But I also want to suggest that we're missing a lot. Uh, and there was some of that mentioned in the different types of data that are available about the past that we're missing a lot in terms of narratives, in terms of the way people talk, in terms of uh, the stories that people tell. And adding those in, I think, moving into the future and thinking about how we can look at these uncountable forms and unmeasurable forms of data is going to be really important. Ding. Okay, I have to make the muted uh, mistake. So Don. Thanks very much, Malka. That was uh, excellent in time. And we're going to wrap up this Act 1 with Steve Ruckels. OK. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm actually uh, maybe misclassified here. I'm the only real historian on this panel, um, uh, the only one who actually works on the history of data. But I'm supposed to talk about the future, so, so that's what I'll do. 
And when it comes to the future of data, I'm, I'm very worried. You know, at one level, we're swimming in data, uh, often uh, accidental data that uh, 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 was collected uh, not to be data, but uh, um, uh, just uh, as a byproduct of transactions, whether it's social media or commercial or whatever. And, you know, the problem with that kind of data is that it's uh, unrepresentative. It doesn't allow generalizations about underlying populations. Uh, and the key elements of designed data, data that are designed to be representative of, representative of individuals uh, 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 in the population are under grave threat. Uh, and this threat comes from uh, excessive concerns about uh, privacy. Uh, the US Census Bureau, people have complained about government intrusion ever since the 1790 census. And in 18, 40, the Census Bureau began to respond to complaints about privacy with promises of non-disclosure. This wasn't what people were actually worried about. My colleague Diana Magnuson and I did a study of newspapers uh, 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 since 1850 uh, of newspaper references to privacy with regard to the census, and we found that nobody was concerned about external disclosure. Uh, out of something like 500 articles, we found only four of them mentioned that. Uh, but uh, what people worried about was just snoopiness by the government. As Chuck Cagle put it, it's none of their damn business. So the Census Bureau announced on May 20th that they were gonna replace the American Community Survey, the main form of individual level uh, representative microdata in the country, uh, with synthetic, fully synthetic data uh, to protect privacy. And this would not be usable for research. And then there was a firestorm on Twitter and the Census Bureau a couple of days later walked it back and said, no, final decisions have been made. But within the Census Bureau, this is what the plan remains. And uh, if that happens, then uh, key elements of our uh, shared data infrastructure will be lost. Okay, hey, on that cheery but very much in time point, um, that does it for Act One. So I'm going to hand it over to the ghost of data past to get going. Yes. I would just like to start by saying that no one was misclassified on this panel and that everyone is fulfilling their role exactly as was intended. Um, so we have about 10 minutes. I'm the ghost of data past, in case you hadn't gathered that already. Um, so in the Charles Dickens story, you probably have gathered that this is where we got the title of the panel from, Scrooge's today is illuminated as being past dependent. His present is determined by choices that he made long ago. So I'm wondering if we could just spend a few minutes talking about what this means when we talk about data. And I think we could interpret this very broadly. It's about methods, but it's about sort of, as several people have already touched on, what makes data? Data are, are everywhere, but data are constructed, right? Um, but I think we could start with a specific question, which is, what would it mean for us to talk about learning from the past where data are concerned? And what does our data past tell us that's useful for our data present and future? And there's no obligation to, to talk, but I'm going to go in the order in which people um, gave their little three minute spiels, which means that we start with Leah. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, recently, um, I, I did, I finished up a project that, uh, looked at slaveholder families, um, after the civil war, what happened to the sons and grandsons of slaveholders. Um, and for this, we were using, um, resources from the Minnesota population center from ancestry.com, et cetera, to come up with very large samples. So, um, you know, could be, uh, 500,000 families. Um, and we came up with some patterns to look at um, what happened after slaveholder families lost wealth during the Civil War. How quickly did the families rebound? Now go back 40 years, and Jonathan Weiner did a very similar study um, for 200 families in a county in Alabama, um, where he also followed these families uh, through the census. He did not look at the second and third generation, just at the slaveholder generation itself after the war. Um, and the um, patterns that he uncovered um, 
were, as it turns out, very similar to what we found when we scaled up, you know, thousands of times uh, the sample size and also looked at multiple generations. Um, and so um, uh, when I think back to uh, Jonathan's approach, he was actually touching all the manuscripts. Um, he was um, intimately um, aware of the details of the families that he was following, and the context in which they lived, um, who was living next to them, um, what was their experience during the war. Um, and though while he was using a quantitative data set, um, it was a lot smaller than the data that, that I used. And so he was able to really know each one of his data points. And so while I don't think that's possible for us using these um, large uh, data's uh, present and future, and even using data past, because we're using incredibly large data sets for the past as well, I think what I would uh, try to learn from the past is um, as much as possible um, dive into subsamples of your data to get to know them as intimately as Jonathan got to know uh, the 200 families in his, in his uh, um, a really exemplary study. John? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I only just want to say that I think that, that we've learned a great deal from mostly the historians who have worked with information from the past for a long time. And uh, like the case Leah was talking about, there's somebody who did it uh, by hand and in the archive and like real, real drudgery. And uh, we have uh, a lot of advantages these days of being able to, uh, to to pull together larger masses of data and 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 manipulate it and learn from it, but 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 mostly I think what we what we can discover now is that the past is full of information. It's just so full of information, like uh, anything that you'd like to know about in the past. It's incredible how much was documented and how much was saved. And we don't have to go to the Babylonian, you know, uh, stone uh, engraved, you know, obelisks or something for this. We could, but in the by the 19th century, my goodness, it, it was all being printed, and and so much of it is saved. I'm doing a study now of the Spanish flu in 1918, and uh, well, all of the death certificates in New York and and Philadelphia are available to transcribe and figure out who died from what and when uh, and in what neighborhood. And well, it uh, just never occurred to me that so much was saved. And that's for me the, the major lesson. So I just wanna follow up on this though, while I have both of you representing data past, because I think this is important for data present and data future. To hear both of you talking about it, it's as if we're on this inexorable march towards a better world of data, that things can only improve because we have more data available now in current time. But if we look backwards, we have these, this wealth of information that we haven't even learned yet to make use of. So do you see this as sort of a positive, positive story? Or do you see that there are, are ways of looking and ways of thinking that we lose as we start to think about what can be, what can be measured? Well, I think Steve is right that we've got to be worried that 100 years from now, people will have the 2030 data about America that, that, that you know, we have it for uh, 1880, but will we have it for 2030? I'm not so sure. Yeah. So if we look at the past 100 years, it's not been the case that data has only ever improved over time. There's actually a period in the 50s and 60s where it's sort of like the data dark ages because there was a transition at that point from documenting everything by hand to using early punch cards and a lot of that material did get lost. Um, and so some of it is recoverable and there are people working on recovering data from the 50s and 60s and some of it is just gone. Um, and then we transition towards more kind of modern computing methods. And so we do actually have more um, that was uh, increasingly saved basically from the 80s onward, but we have a, a lot of missing information. So we should not think that it's just going to be, uh, you know, an ever improving um, picture. But I think you're absolutely right, Rachel, that um, we have uh, only just scratched the surface of what we might know about the past. Given the technologies that we had to compile information, 
um, you know, people did as best they could um, and they were able to get samples of a thousand and that was great. And now we can get samples of a million and um, that is better on some dimensions. But what I was trying to emphasize is like, I think we don't want to lose the, the kind of closeness to, um, to our data points um, as we go from a, hunt, a thousand uh, to a million. Yeah, that's a very good point. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the ghost of data presence. Sure. I, I regret I don't have the, uh, <laughs> the costume here. But uh, for the ghost of data present, um, we, in the, in the uh, Dickensian story, we learn sort of a, a new perspective, both on what's happening now and also our involvement in what uh, the story is. Um, so for the, the data present panelists, Beth and uh, Letitia, uh, I have one kind of starter question. What kinds of forms of data are we missing now in order to make things better? And that could be things in the real world, that could be things about your research, um, or it could be data about data that could make it higher quality, better, or more applicable. Uh, so if, may I start? Yes, please do. Yeah, so I mean, I, um, so I think what we miss, so it's a bit what I started to mention earlier about uh, marginalized groups. So I think we have a data gap uh, that is clear. So there are some people that are not represented or misrepresented. So we have access to large scale data, it's true, but there is the risk to make uh, poli policy, um, to have um, a policy making based on, on such large data sets that are misrepresentative, so that are a distorted picture of what is the, the reality. So I would say that one, one thing we miss is, uh, I mean, is, is the data about, about some of the uh, marginalized, uh, marginalized groups. And, and then, uh, so I'm, I'm not some only thinking about the kind of data we miss, but what we miss about data. So I think we miss common standards about data. So this is one thing to have access to data, but also another thing is to have some kind of common standards. So I'm thinking about on the way the data are released and the way the data are processed. So uh, it happens that there is a lot of data, but is not uh, always easy to find. Um, this is uh, this is uh, also uh, hard to access because because of the data ownership we were uh, mentioning earlier. So, uh, so, so some, most of the data that are uh, generated by users are owned by companies, and uh, uh, having access to this uh, data is not uh, is not uh, always uh, always easy. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I would say that the, the, um, I mean, the two things that I think are, are missing is really these common standards, both to uh, release the data and process the data, and then uh, having more, I mean, or at least improving uh, data collection about uh, marginalized group. And one thing I want to emphasize is that even though we have access to a lot of data, a lot of these data are uh, passively collecting. So, I mean, like, if I'm thinking about mobility, uh, okay, we can monitor uh, mobility of individuals uh, with, uh, with GPS, but this is not an answer to a specific question like we had on, in a survey where we were interested in one particular aspect of mobility and we could ask this question. This is just passive collection. So we measure one thing, but this one thing might not be what we are looking we are looking for. So this is somehow what we are also missing uh, when I mean when I'm thinking about data present. Right. And then Beth, would you like to go? Yeah, I'm going to echo a lot of those themes. So yes, there's inadequate data on marginalized groups. For example the population data sets, graded population data that a lot of satellite scientists work with, like me, that are counting people around the world and trying to measure exposure and vulnerability to hazards. Um, don't incorporate people that are moving. Refugee camps are left off of those maps. And even that data is basically just downscaled census data from each country. So all of the uncertainty in that, there's so many people that are uncounted, especially um, yeah, refugee populations, uh, indigenous groups in a lot of countries. But I actually think the bigger problem, and I previewed this before, is our lack of data on the powerful, not the marginalized. 
um, because that's who we need to be regulating for environmental change and I think for the climate crisis. So um, it's tracking flows of money and who owns what. And Letitia talked about this a little bit too. Companies, I mean, we have more data, I think, on marginalized groups that are living in places that have high rates of deforestation than we have on the companies that are actually cutting down the trees and where all of that money is flowing. So to me, that's the big missing gap. And we really need to think about sort of that inequality in data. And the second thing would be access. So who has access to um, the best algorithms to crunch data? Um, and we're kind of talking in the climate change sector about this. Jesse Keenan writes about the financial arms race for climate services. Who has access to the best data on changing climate right now? It's companies that are speculating on environmental change, but not the countries that are actually being affected the most by that change. They often don't have like even the computing or the internet to be kind of crunching deep learning algorithms that consulting companies are crunching for companies. So who has the resources to adapt to climate change and the best data to do so are not vulnerable populations. So that's a second area I'd like to see change. It's interesting that that sort of presupposes a question that I had included as, as a second kind of starter for 10, which is um, what's happening right now that you don't think we actually have data on? You know, what, what are the things that we would wish in 10 years that we were thinking about or trying to measure? And it definitely seems like that's, that's um, one example. I'd like to open up to maybe another panelist if there's anybody who'd like to jump in or Leticia, if you'd like to come in. We have a little bit of time if anybody wants to speak on that point. Well, I'd like to follow up on the data access question just very briefly. Uh, the, some people, and I'm one of these people, has access to the original census data records uh, from pretty much 1960 to, to the present uh, in a census research data center. And there's things you can do with that that are pretty cool. Uh, but most people don't have it. And at the moment, most people can't get it. And, and I'm very uh, un unhappy with that. And I'm unsure about even the ethics of publishing from that data source, although, you know, to the extent that I'm able to liberate data, uh, get it disclosed, uh, add noise to it, and, you know, like, yeah, I, uh, I'll do that. But I'm quite concerned that uh, there's such a strong hierarchy of access. This is within the United States to the very best data, and, and it ought to be more spread out. Mm -hmm. That does make sense. Malka, um, did, you, did you want to say something? Sorry, you're muted. <laughs> uh, I agree with that very much. And I also want to add one point into this question of um, who we have data about and also the passive data, which is this questions of consent um, as well as ownership. Like it's the data that is hidden from us about the powerful is mostly because they can choose. Um, and the data that is available to us uh, is often for, from people who might consent but don't have the the capacity to we we, we don't ask them uh, they don't have the information to to con consent in a meaningful way obviously even if they are asked um so uh so that's one thing but i also want to add another dimension to this which is the question of this 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 gap from data to action and between data and policy um i did a, a little bit of research on the um the program that was done uh, with uh, satellites to observe uh, the atrocities going on in Darfur uh, some time ago, 10 years ago. And there was a really amazing and comprehensive data pointing to atrocities being committed. And, and the people who worked on the project kind of thought, okay, we have, we have nailed them, we got it, we see it, it's done. And there was no action, no real meaningful action taken because that political will step was missing because the questions is not only do we have the data, it's also who, you know, who is seeing it that, that cares and, you know, do, do the same people who say they care about collecting the data also care enough to take the action? Um, are we communicating the data to enough people um, that they will see it and it will make sense to them? So I, I want to just add in that step of you know, getting from data to action, to change, to understanding. Thank you for that. Um, and Leah, did I see you try and jump in as well or no? 
No? Okay, cool. Um, well then with that, um, I think I will end my haunting of you all and pass off to the next ghost, uh, Danny. Okay. So uh, we're moving into the future territory, which is this stuff of the unwritten, so to speak, and the stuff that we still need to need to write. And somewhat picking up on, I'm sure the speakers will pick up on some of those comments, but one thing moving, in, uh, since we're moving into the, the speculative realm, one of the things that I was very curious to as the two speakers is how do you think or how do you view that we're going to know the future? Say, right now we have a, uh, in some ways I feel that we have a combination of public data like the census and we're starting to have more and more private data that inform public decisions. And I wonder whether you see this trend changing or evolving and, and in either case, how do you see these becoming, you know, the lenses, the data lenses that we use to, to make, uh, well, to, to run the world effectively. Uh, Mark, do you want to go first? Sure. So, you know, I think, again, I, I, I want to see the future as choices and as something that's open to us. Um, I run, a, I, I teach a course on predictive fictions, by which I mean to say that all of our predictions of the future are fictional. And so no matter how rigorous or how scientific we think a particular area is, whether it's meteorology or whether it's macroeconomics um, or whether it's science fiction, we know that there's a lot of room in there of guesswork and a lot of distance from, from the ground truth as we've been talking about. Um, so, you know, I think that we can see the way things are going right now. And the way things are going right now also I mean, we are always, always, the present is always a crossroads, roads, right? So we have a lot of choices, but we can see right now that we have this tension. We have uh, these large corporations that are controlling most of the data. But we have this understanding and these frameworks that are developing for us to understand this and to see this, uh, this uneven um, asymmetrical uh, information situation that's going on. Um, we we have people talking about surveillance capitalism. We have people understanding that, uh, that you know having clicking yes on the terms of service is not really an informed consent to the amount uh, that's being done with our data. Um, not to mention again the people whose data is being gathered in ways that are are, are well beyond even that click. Uh, so you know we have we can see different features. One that go, goes much more into this where the majority of data is held not by governments, um, and it's no longer the state that sees most, but by corporations. Um, and, and then we can see also this line between corporations and governments really blurring. Um, and, and we can see that blur also in the ways that, you know, democracy has become very much about data and the elections and campaigning have become very much about collecting this data and seeing the ways to use it. And yet we see that, uh, you know, despite some of the successes by, by people doing that in elections, and despite some of the failures in the predictive ads that we see that have nothing to do with what we actually want to buy, corporations are still much better at this, this element, um, than politi most political parties are. And so there is this, this potential for the appropriation of the language and the mechanisms of democracy by these corporations with an, am an amazing amount of data collection power and an amazing degree of experience in manipulation of people's preferences. So that, you know, that's one kind of very scary direction we can go. We also see this other direction where we have people uh, getting more consciousness about what uh, it means to have their data collected, about what they're giving up in this. Um, we, see, we do see a democratization of data with more people having access with more people having their voices heard um, there is you know there is this scariness of digital data will it still be available in the future but if it is there's certainly a lot more in there than of you know the people who had the wherewithal to write letters to newspapers for example in the past um, and and in that direction you know we can see the potential of people thinking about different models of how we do uh, approach data, how we think about data's role in our lives, and again, you know, who has control of it, who owns it, who has access to it, and access not only to the raw data, but also to those algorithms, as were mentioned, and the computing power to understand what that data means. Um, and, you know, I also want to just say very quickly, we do see these pendulum swings. So right now, you know, everyone's excited about big data. Again, everyone's excited about the quant. I am starting to feel a, a pendulum swing a bit to the more qualitative and narrative side, just in the sense that I 
am being asked very often in my capacity as a science fiction writer to consult on like important stuff and, and help people think imaginatively about the future. So I think there's a start of a swing there. And I wonder if there's also going to be a start of a swing to uh, kind of as Leah was, was mentioning, the more personalized, you know, thinking more about uh, individuals and, and that as opposed to this like giant data sets. Um, or hopefully not as opposed, hopefully in combination with, but that was a lot. Throw Super, it all, all excellent. Um, Steve, do you want to go ahead? Okay. <clears throat> well, former census director uh, Bob Groves uh, drew a distinction between designed data and organic data. And designed data is, <clears throat> well, fundamentally censuses and surveys, but also satellite imagery, other, other types of data where uh, it's systematically collected for the purpose of being data. Organic data is primarily transactional, which is uh, either commercial data or uh, social media data, data that, that comes about because of uh, other activities that people are doing. And, you know, John Logan was talking uh, earlier about, oh, what a wealth of data there is in the past. Well, there, there isn't really. There's basically design data was invented with the beginning of the statistical age uh, at the end of the 18th century and didn't really become widespread until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and prior to that, you're essentially dealing with organic data. You've got some parish register data that people uh, did not because they were collecting data, but because they, they uh, wanted to record the baptisms and burials and stuff like that. Uh, and you've got commercial records and you've got, and you've got asylum record, you know, military records, uh, but they were all records that were created for administrative or commercial purposes. Uh, and so we have this fairly brief period where we have the, uh, the, the design data. The, the, the problem with the organic data, the transactional data, whether it's from the 18th or 17th century or whether it's uh, from Twitter, uh, is that you have absolutely no idea what it refers to. It, it's useful, it, 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 you know, I, my first paper that I ever wrote was about uh, 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 2,000 prostitutes in an asylum in Philadelphia from 1838 to, to 1908. And I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to be able to talk about how prostitution changed in Philadelphia. And of course, I couldn't. All I could tell about was about that particular institu institution. And I could write an institutional history, and that's interesting. With, with Twitter data, you can write about Twitter as an institution. You can't make generalizations about anything else. Uh, and so that's why uh, uh, the excessive and, and, and uh, what uh, Leah was talking about, about uh, the uh, excessive, one of the reasons why the historical data is so powerful is because it's unconstrained by absurdly uh, 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 extreme extremist confidentiality concerns. And so for the period uh, uh, prior to 1950, uh, we have much more access to data uh, than we do for the period after 1950. I mean, John Logan mentioned that as well, that everything uh, is in the research data center uh, or it's, it's very blurred. Um, and, um, uh, and even that blurred stuff is going away if the Census Bureau gets its way. And every other country is going to follow suit. Uh, and, so, um, and so, you know, what we're going to be left with is the kind of uh, uh, organic transactional data that we have for the 17th century, and that's not a good thing. Okay. Plus satellite imagery, though, which is very good. <laughs> Excellent. So be, before we wrap up, and if I can ask you both, Mark and Steve, to be uh, brief so we stick to five, but I do want to end hopefully on a positive note today. And <laughs> my final question was, if we do things right, you know, do things right in, in quotations and take everything in consideration Malka just talked about, about, you know, what imagining the future means. What do you think is the most exciting thing that you can think about the future when we talk about data? What, what's the price for doing things right? Uh, well, you know, I, I think that we have there's there's so much potential for what we could do to um, to live better, you know, and to to make better choices with with more data. And a, a lot of my science fiction book is kind of about this, and it's about the fact that 
if we want to have a democracy, you know, if we believe in the idea of people making decisions, we need information to make those decisions. Um, and we really have the potential to have a lot of data about uh, what happens when we do things and what the choices are we're making and what are the positives and negatives, what is the nuance, um, you know, the, 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 the risks there, we need to make sure that we understand that data is never going to be perfect. We need to communicate that all of this is, does involve some probabilities and some guesswork, um, but at the same time, we do have so much comprehensive stuff and we have uh, so much information that we could be using to help people from an individual level to a collective level to be really making better decisions. And, and I think that's, that, you know, there's just so much cool stuff we could be doing with it. I hope we do. That's a nice carrot, hopefully. I have a concern. And oh. my concern is that we've talked so much about data as though data were like somewhere there's, there's truth in the data. There's truth in the data. Oh, we want the data. And well, so I, my concern is that all data gets spun in one way or another. It gets worked into a narrative. And the question is, is not just about what kind of data do we have, but who is in a position to spin the narrative? And uh, you know, academics uh, have a, a very privileged position in, in this respect. Uh, advocacy groups, are in a different kind of a position because they have a spin that they're looking for. And uh, the corporate sector, of course, has another kind of a spin and the political parties have another kind of a spin. And uh, I, I think we're, we, need, we need to talk about how the narrative is developed from the data, at least as much as we need to talk about the data. Yeah, in, indeed, important time uh, point. Um, Steve, do you want to finish with a final yeah. one minute on what's what's exciting? If we do well, I think right. what's exciting is that uh, in in a number of countries, the United States, the Nordic countries, uh, Britain, uh, uh, and, uh, and and Canada, uh, we have the potential to trace uh, most people all the way from the early to middle 19th century uh, up to the present across generations and link in administrative. So you have this design data as a core, which is either population registers or censuses or a combination of the two. And, and uh, then you, you link in administrative data uh, and data from other sources that is organic. Uh, and it's that combination of organic and designed data, which will allow us to study the transformation of uh, 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 society over this in, this extraordinary period of change of uh, the last uh, uh, 200 years uh, uh, that is, you know uh, and this is just emerging and it's emerging partly because of the uh, availability the collaboration of uh, uh, genealogical organizations and other uh, and, and governmental uh, um, uh, 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 or agencies particularly in the Nordic countries. Uh, and it's just, it's, I think it's going to have a transformative impact on um, history. Super. Okay, so I think that does it. Um, Rachel, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, I mean, there's so much that I would like yeah. to be saying, and I wish that yeah. we had so much more time for everyone to weigh in because I'm less with lots and lots of questions and comments. And I know that on Twitter, there were lots of really fantastic questions for it. So those of you who maybe have a few minutes and have the inclination might have a look. But mostly, I would like to really thank our panelists for taking the time to do this. I know that it was a whirlwind tour of topics that are really interesting and really merit you know, delving into them more deeply. But we faced a time constraint. And I think that we all deserve a little pat on the back for coming in on time. And I'm going to turn it over to Levi and Danny now, just to say whatever they wanted. Sure. Just want to say thank you very much for attending. I can appreciate that it's very short, but I, I also really think that everybody gave a very clear perspective on their own uh, ideas about data past, present, and future. So I really appreciate it. Recording will be posted to our uh, seminar series YouTube channel, um, and we'll notify everybody when that goes up live. So thank you very much again. Yeah, and I'll just wrap up in the less than a minute that I have to say again, thank you, thank you, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, for those of you who are viewing this, 
uh, everyone responded very quickly and everything worked exactly as you would want things to work on these cases which is almost never the case so it was all the all the much better thank you very much and i just wish that we could take this over for a few more hours or days together so thanks very much happy holidays everyone thank you very much thank you to our audience um, thank you for having us yeah. thank you panelists thank you have Thanks a for bringing us together. I learned a lot. Anytime. <laughs> Bye. Bye.